By the end of the Civil War second year, Union forces in the West controlled much of the Mississippi River, except for one vital stretch. Few Northern boats tested the strong Confederate river batteries at Port Hudson or at Vicksburg, known as the Gibraltar of the Confederacy. President Abraham Lincoln claimed Vicksburg the key to winning the Civil War. But by late 1862, Union naval efforts there had failed. That key remained firmly in Southern hands. Using the Mississippi River and its major tributaries to move men and munitions, the Union Army had won a series of victories in the West, and they hadn't done it alone. In late 1861, the U.S. War Department had rapidly built a fleet of ironclad riverboats never before seen in warfare. By late 1862, this brown water navy and Major General Ulysses S. Grant's army set their sights on the city that Confederate President Jefferson Davis claimed was the nail head that held the South's two halves together. With most of the South's ports blockaded by Union ships, Vicksburg's connection to the Trans-Mississippi region made it critical to the Confederacy's very survival. Texas beef and Louisiana sugar, salt, and molasses fed the Southern armies. Lead from Missouri filled Southern rifles, and it all funneled through Vicksburg's rail lines. The defense of Vicksburg and Port Hudson fell to Lieutenant General John Pemberton, who was a Pennsylvanian by birth, but sided with the South at the urging of his wife, a Virginian. With little combat experience, his orders are to hold Vicksburg at all costs. In late 1862, Grant began his campaign for Vicksburg with a two-pronged strike, intending to lure Confederate forces from Vicksburg with the first prong, while the second, commanded by Major General William Sherman, struck at the city's lightly held defenses. But Confederate cavalry hit first, cutting Grant's long supply line, forcing him to fall back and allowing Confederates to shift men by rail to defeat Sherman's attacks at Chickasaw Bayou in late December. Grant spends the winter and early spring of 1863 trying a variety of routes to Vicksburg, each ending in failure. Yet amidst growing public cries to replace him and against the advice of his closest advisors, Grant grew bolder embarking upon the largest amphibious campaign in American history up to that time. In late March, Grant orders Major General John McClernand's 13th Corps to improve the route across Louisiana's swampy river bottoms. Out of the reach of Vicksburg's big guns, the Union force would then be ferried across the mighty river and onto Mississippi soil. Grant's plan is intricate, risky. Success hinges on Admiral David Porter's fleet of gunboats and troop transports, which on the night of April 16th make a daring race past the Vicksburg batteries, hugging the riverbank below to withstand their fire. Even with Porter's fleet south of Vicksburg, Grant continues to keep Pemberton guessing as to where he'll attack. On April 17th, the day after Porter's daring run, Grant launches a federal cavalry raid into the heart of Mississippi. On April 29th, Sherman feints an attack north of Vicksburg, while Union gunboats shell Grand Gulf, where Grant actually plans to ferry his army across the Great River. The cavalry raid ties up Pemberton's cavalry, leaving river crossings unguarded. Sherman's feint draws Confederate attention north of the city. Both keep Pemberton distracted from the true threat at Grand Gulf. 
The batteries there were too strong for Union gunboats, so Grant adapts and crosses instead at Bruinsburg. By April 30th, Grant realizes a goal he had toiled six months to achieve. The lead element of his army is on the Confederate side of the river. For the next 17 days, his army would march more than 200 miles and fight five battles in a campaign never before witnessed on American soil. Moving inland, up steep bluffs, march the soldiers of McLaren's Corps. In the early morning hours of May 1st, they hit a Confederate brigade. For the next 17 hours, up to 8,000 Confederates put up a noble defense in the rugged terrain surrounding Fort Gibson, holding back 20,000 Federals. By late afternoon, outflanked and low on ammunition, the Confederates fall back. The loss here causes the Confederate evacuation of Grand Gulf on May 2nd. With his beachhead secure, Grant's plan truly unfolds. Now, aware of Grant's true intentions, Pemberton assumes he will march north for Vicksburg. But Grant has already rejected that approach as too restrictive. Instead, using the Big Black River as a shield, he plans to cut the rail line which feeds Vicksburg with supplies and reinforcements. Then he will turn and trap Pemberton at Vicksburg. It was this type of bold, indirect strategy that would become the hallmark of Grant's military career. By May 12th, joined by Sherman's Corps, Grant marches along a 10-mile front aiming to attack the Southern Railroad the next morning. Pemberton shifts his army and rushes a Confederate brigade by rail to Jackson with orders to strike Grant's right flank. These 3,000 Confederates slam into Major General James McPherson's 10,000 men along the banks of 14 Mile Creek, just southwest of Raymond. Unaware that they are outnumbered three to one, Confederates launch a fierce attack. After almost six hours, McPherson's artillery and numeric advantage has the rebels retreating to Jackson. Realizing he can't safely march on Vicksburg with a large body of Confederates now at his rear, Grant wields two-thirds of his army toward the state capital. He cuts rail and telegraph lines along the way and hinders communication between Pemberton and the one man sent to assist him. On the night of May 13th, General Joe Johnston, the hero of First Manassas, arrives at Jackson to take charge of the grim Confederate predicament in Mississippi. Within hours, even as his reinforcements near Jackson, Johnston wires the authorities in Richmond that he is too late and orders the city evacuated. The next morning, Sherman and McPherson's divisions push back Confederate artillery and roadblocks from a handful of Confederate regiments. By late afternoon on May 14th, the United States flag flies once again over the state capitol. Grant spares none of his men to occupy Jackson and put its military supplies and rail lines to the torch. Then he turns his army toward Vicksburg. As Jackson burned, Pemberton had moved with 20,000 men to attack Grant's supply line. Without a working telegraph, Confederate communications unraveled. As Johnson gathers reinforcements to the northeast, Pemberton moves southeast. On May 16th, Pemberton receives a two-day-old message from Johnston, ordering him to Clinton. As Pemberton reverses his column, Grant closes in. 
Pemberton hastily deploys his divisions along a three-mile front to face two advancing Federal columns, but he is unaware of a third moving toward his exposed left flank. Brigadier General Stephen Lee of Stevenson's division shifts his brigade to a hill owned by Sid Champion. Brigadier General Alfred Cummings Georgians move to fill a gap and block the Union Division's closing on the middle road. And at 10.30 that morning, at Champion Hill, Grant starts the battle, destined to seal Vicksburg's eventual fate. If Pemberton's thin left flank crumbles, Grant will control the Baker's Creek Bridge and Pemberton's escape route to Vicksburg. Seth Barton's Georgia Brigade hustles to stop the Union onslaught. By 11.30 a.m., the fighting on Champion Hill turns viciously hand-to-hand, -hand, with Stevenson's division eventually thrown back to the Jackson Road. Major General John Bowen's division savagely drives the Federals back to the Champion House. But a second Federal assault overwhelms them. Reinforcements led by Major General William Warren arrive too late and Bowen's men fall back. Their retreat turns to panic as Grant's divisions converge. Their main escape route, now cut off, Pemberton's men had managed to construct a second bridge, which they used to retreat to Edwards. Though not before Grant's army is able to strand Loring on the east side of Baker's Creek. Out of communication with Pemberton, and believing Grant has already taken Edwards, Loring orders his vital 8,000-man division to Jackson and away from the defenses at Vicksburg. Unaware of Loring's decision, Pemberton waits for him that night in the fortification at the Big Black River Bridge. Instead, he is met the next morning by McLaren's Corps, which immediately attack and send the rebels running to the safety of Vicksburg. The battles at Champion Hill and Big Black River cost Pemberton dearly 25% of his army, 45 cannon, and the faith of his men. 30 years ago to the day, Pemberton had accepted a cadetship to West Point. As he rode back to Vicksburg, he notes, and today that career is ended in disaster and disgrace. Grant's trap is now set. On May 17th, Pemberton's demoralized soldiers, reeling from the loss at Big Black River, began streaming into the city. They worked through the night to shore up their fortifications. Vicksburg's land defenses stretch more than eight miles, with nine major forts connected by rifle pits, artillery embrasures, and parapets of earthen logs. One such stockade redan guarded the graveyard road leading into Vicksburg. Wanting to avoid a lengthy siege, Grant attacked here on May 19th. After a five-hour artillery barrage, Sherman goes in, but piles of brush and sharpened tree limbs unravel formations as Confederate crossfire cuts men down in scores. Pinned down, Confederates lob hand grenades into their midst. The Federals use the cover of darkness to fall back to their lines. Almost 1,000 of Grant's men are killed, wounded or missing. Behind his stout defenses, Pemberton loses only 70. On May 22nd, Grant tries again on a much wider three-mile front. Only McClernand's Corps gains a foothold. He sends Grant a message to keep up the pressure. But they are beaten back and lose another 3,000 men. Grant realizes he has no other choice but to lay siege, ordering his commanders to dig their lines closer to the Confederate trenches. By mid-June, they begin mining beneath the 3rd Louisiana Redan, and on June 25th, 
the Federals explode 2,200 pounds of black powder. Soldiers from both sides pour into the crater, fighting for more than 20 hours before Grant calls off the attacks. By July 6, the Federals will be prepared to detonate 13 more mines, but it will not be necessary. For 47 days, soldiers and Vicksburg citizens endure a constant nightmare. Day and night, up to 220 cannon blast the southern defenses from the land as Porter's gunboats shelled Vicksburg's batteries from the river. Citizens took to living in hillside caves for shelter. Food and water grow scarce. As disease flourishes, medical supplies dwindle. Every public building and many homes are now hospitals. Wagons make daily rounds to pick up the dead. Rebel soldiers' rations are by now a handful of peas and rice and a single cup of water per day. Sickness and desertion leave fewer men on the front lines. One day in late June, a notice slid under the door of Pemberton's headquarters. It reads, if you can't feed us, surrender us. Signed, many soldiers. Following a dire report from his subordinates that his army lacks the strength to make a breakout attack on July 2nd, Pemberton realizes he has no choice. He must surrender. On July 3rd, 1863, there came a sound, ominous for some, for weeks unheard by all. Silence. That day, Grant and Pemberton meet to discuss terms of surrender. With the anniversary of American independence only a day away, Pemberton hopes Grant will be in a generous mood. Instead, Grant demands unconditional surrender. Pemberton refuses. Later that evening, Grant offers terms. Instead of taking Pemberton's army prisoner, he will parole them. Many will go home at once. Pemberton accepts, and on the 4th of July, the Confederates stack arms, handing over the city of Vicksburg to the Union forces. The South's Gibraltar had fallen. With the capture of Port Hudson, five days later, the Mississippi River is entirely in Union hands. Grant loses 10,000 killed, wounded, or missing, and inflicts nearly as many losses on the Confederates. But aided by Porter's fleet, he disperses an entire rebel army and cuts the South supply line. Soon, even the most basic goods like salt to preserve meat would grow increasingly scarce. Yet the Vicksburg campaign is overshadowed in the press by the Confederate defeat at Gettysburg the day before. And only in the coming decades would Grant's accomplishment be recognized. Late into the 20th century, coalition forces in the first Gulf War were still using tactics inspired by Grant's Vicksburg campaign. And it was at Vicksburg that the blue and the gray found unity in the cause of preservation. Their efforts resulted in the establishment of the Vicksburg National Military Park in 1899. Today, that preservation effort continues so that the sacrifices made there by both sides will not be forgotten.